my feeling is that the composers that Kronos works with are people that have been really inspiring to me personally. What I find is that there's a, a moment which is, is the right moment for somebody to do something new. And I feel like part of my job and my responsibility to Kronos is to be sure I know when that moment is with each of the collaborators. Our concerts at YBCA uh, are the final concerts of our three-year residency there. And it seemed to me it would be a nice way to conclude this adventure, to explore some of the music that's being written right here in, in our city. Dan Becker is uh, a wonderful force in music in, in San Francisco. My grandfather on my mom's side played trumpet in some of the big bands in the 1920s. He played in, in Paul Whiteman's band for a while uh, in the late teens, and he played in this one band based out of Cleveland called the Phillips Spitali Orchestra. And these recordings, lots of old 78s on the Victor uh, Talking uh, Label Company, um, Victor Talking Machine Company, uh, were all lost when my, when my father, grandfather passed away in the 60s. And it wasn't until about the mid-90s that an old uh, distant cousin found three old 78s up in her attic. And it was the first time that we discovered any of the recordings from my grandfather. The sort of bittersweet part of it is that in the midst of writing this piece, my, my dad passed away last, last January 2012. And suddenly the title of the piece, Carrying the Past, started to take on a whole different kind of significance to me. So for me, the piece was very, is very personal. The most wonderful thing was in July, I was able to actually spend two to three hours having a workshop session with them that was recorded. So I got to try out about five or six little chunks of ideas to see how they would work. A lot of experiments blending the old music and new music. Um, to see if, if it worked, if they could play along with the old music, if we could make the quartet sound, 1920s, and et cetera, et cetera. The idea of like Taylor making a piece for, a, of a, for an ensemble, and not just writing a piece for, the, for the, those instruments, but for those people, for those players, that's something that I'm very, very big on and, and felt um, really honored to do that with Kronos, especially since they're, since they're local. We've played Carrying the Past once in Cleveland, and uh, it was really fun. It's, it, his music has this momentum, and uh, you get the sense like you're right on the edge of your chair the whole time. Nathaniel Stuckey has written a, a wonderful new piece for Kronos, and it's, um, it clearly is written by a composer that uh, has played quartets. He knows the uh, history of string quartets, and he's kind of adding to it in, in a new way. So this piece uh, was inspired by a book by Nicholson Baker called The Mezzanine. Um, and The Mezzanine is basically a, well, it's sort of a novel. 
it's a novel that looks very, very closely at things that seem trivial, like milk cartons and escalators and urinals and how people wrap cookies at Mrs. Fields. Well, all chamber music is kind of very detail-oriented and focused on small things. And the more I worked on the piece, the more I started relating it to this book, which is also focused on minutia of tiny things. So we tend to, to, we might give something a dramatic title, but we tend to say, but don't look for that in the music. Well, in this case, I want people to look for that. I, by the end, I was so completely focused on trying to make, uh, you know, tying shoelaces in a bow into music that I really want people to look for that at this point. That's really what it's about. I'm a string player and I really wanted to write them a string quartet's quartet. I wanted it to be all about string playing and, and you know, there's, there's something about being a, a violinist uh, myself. It's, it just feels natural to me. I really wanted to focus on their instruments. He lives on the same bus line as I do, and I first met him when he was picking up one of his kids. And so this, this is truly handmade music um, by somebody that lives right nearby. And so you get this feeling that um, we're continuing uh, a tradition that started way back in about 1750 when Haydn was making his quartets at the Esterhazy Palace. I was born. I was born. Born. I was born. I was born. I was born. I was born in. I was born in. I was born in Bogota, Colombia, South America. I was born in Japan. I was born in Muscatine. I was born in Fort Smith, Arkansas. In Western Australia. I was born. Pamela Z is a really creative musician that I've known for years. And this will be the first time that we've worked together. The piece is called And the Movement of the Tongue, and it's about speaking accents, particularly accented English, um, people who are speaking English either with regional accents from around the country or with foreign language accents, people who've come from other places and are speaking uh, English as a second language. And I thought it would be um, wonderful if there could be a new piece that celebrated the way, some of the ways that our language is spoken by people in San Francisco. And, and Pamela liked that idea and she's been working on it ever since. To create the piece, I started by interviewing a lot of people, almost 30 people I think it was, but 20 some people um, that I interviewed. and. Um, Typically, I would just bring them to my studio and I asked them all a series of questions, pretty much the same questions, um, where they come from, um, to talk about if they believe that they speak with an accent and what they, how they feel about their accent, um, any thoughts they have about speaking with an accent. If I go home, it, I slip right back into it. Home. 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 In working with the text, I listen very carefully to sometimes individual phrases or words, and I, and I find the melody in the spoken word, because uh, um, spoken language has a lot more pitch material in, in it 
than most people are aware. This, this particular thing that you're looking at right here is uh, probably 20 different people saying the word rain. 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 You walk down the street in San Francisco and you can hear so many different forms of English. Um, and I actually interviewed David and all the other members of the quartet as part, so their voices are in the piece. I don't, I don't know. know anymore. Hmm? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I don't speak with that accent. There's a movement called the tongue, which is uh, the, the title of the piece and the movement of the tongue comes out of that movement. And in that movement, um, it's a very short little movement, but that I found somehow touching that just a few of the people who speak English as a second language um, seem to gravitate towards talking about when they are trying to learn to speak English and they're trying to sort of, you know, learn to speak with a better, what they think of as a more correct accent, um, that they are watching other people and what they do with their tongue because they realize that the position of the tongue is really key to how words are pronounced. A certain idea of middle America. Muscatine, Iowa. I don't know where the neutral accent would be located. Berkeley, California. San Francisco. On NPR. I don't know where the neutral accent would be located. A lot of the music that uh, uh, Kronos is attached to does not follow that traditional Western scale model. They're all the notes in between that to Western ears often sound, oh, that's a little out of tune. No, it's based on uh, microtonal scales. I think over the years, Steve has probably arranged or translated 45 or 50 pieces for us. If I'm recreating a piece of Ethiopian folk folklore, it's thousands, has its roots thousands of years of history. I'm going to try to be as, as, um, um, as authentic in my transcription of that as possible. From that point, then we go into the other room called the arranging room. It's a huge responsibility, really, to you know, take a, mu a form of music from, that's central to one culture, one society, and find another form that it can be alive and well in. We want to adhere to the intention behind the piece of folk music. That's what we want to adhere to. And that intention, we have, it, and that comes from listening to the original, from doing some research as to where it comes from. What does it mean? What does the song mean? How old has it been? What area, if it's possible, in, in my case, I travel to the country, you know, I, went, I wanted to go to India and have first-hand count of folk music. I think for him, music is, is something that grows out of his, his family, his personal life. It's, it, it, uh, m music is just a central part of his thinking. My father was an a amateur singer, so he'd want, you know, he'd say, do you know, uh, have we ever done Moon Glow? And I know, I said, no. And so then he'd start, you know. And so I'd go. He'd say, no, that's not it. That's not the chord. That's it. Yeah. So he, that's how he swiped into it. I learned a lot of the standards just through trial and error with him telling me what to do. Not a, very, not, not a fun activity for a nine-year-old, I tell you, particularly with your dad. For me, Kronos is kind of a model of what YBCA is, can be, should be, in terms of being really grounded in the San Francisco Bay Area. They are a San Francisco Bay Area group. This is a group that didn't and probably couldn't have happened anywhere else. Yet their reach is 
all over. We've worked with, um, you know, all sorts of musicians and all kinds of styles, and it seems to me the audience at uh, YBCA is uh, ready to be um, taken somewhere they haven't been before. <laughs> And it's it's a fascination uh, for me and for and for Kronos with human culture. Just thinking about Kronos, the fact that they're here and um, they've been an inspiration to me and a lot of other people over these years. Whenever we feel their presence here in the city, is they're they're more inspiring, I think, than they even really realize. And one of the things that they do, I think, at least, and have done for me, is expand my concept of what is beautiful music. I, I want music to. Uh, teach me new things, to take me to new areas of life and experience. And I think that uh, our composers regularly do that. Mm -hmm.